semantic segmentation is very crucial in self-driving cars and robotics because it is important for the models to understand the context in the environment in which they are operating. Understanding this, we have come up with this semantic segmentation tutorial. Now, before we go ahead with the session, I'd like to inform you that we have launched a completely free platform called Great Learning Academy, where you have access to free courses such as AI, Cloud and Digital Marketing. You can check out the details in the description below. The agenda for today's session will be uh, what is segmentation basically. So we will see what is the use of segmentation, uh, what do we get out of it, what are the industry applications of it and how it works. Uh, post that we will do uh, uh, one of the net popular networks under segmentation. It's probably we can say unit. All right. Now if you remember uh, last time I showed you guys auto encoders, do you remember that? MNIST data we used the numbers. So yes, I say it is a part of dimensionality reduction or deep learning. Correct. The same concept is going to come back to unit. So if you can recollect that particular session or the code, probably I think we took 15 20 minutes of quick, quick uh, session on that. It is almost similar to unit. So we'll see to it. And not only unit, there are many of these, but for today's session and for our course, unit is in scope. So we'll see that. Plus, we will do one case study onto this. Okay. Uh, after that, the second part of it is uh, I will show you one more network called Mobile Net. So I hope you people now are familiar with VGG, right? Last time we did VGG, you remember? So VGG is a very heavy one, right? Everybody agrees to that. It cannot be used on a cell phone or a small clickable device. The hardware will not support it. So what do we have? We have got a smaller lightweight version of that, which we call it mobile. So we will see how we can uh, get the same performance by reducing number of multiplications and all whatever extra lot of layers in VGG. You know? So we'll try to find that out. And uh, after that, what a thing. Hey, hi, Dhruv. Uh, after that, let me also check if anything is pending. Yes, yes, yes. No. Okay. After that, if we get time, so it's going to go a little heavy. If we get time, we will start with RCNNs. Yeah. So I'll take you guys through what is RCNN and then I think I already shown you guys once, but we'll do it, redo it. What is fast RCNN and what is fastest, faster RCNN. So we'll see how we can improve CNN. All right. So basically, this is for object detection. This is also for object detection, but in this we do some something like a segmentation part of it, and this also holds the same thing. So now we are moving from, uh, I will say, classification to detection. All right. Now coming to the first part of it, what exactly is your understanding on unit? What is happening in unit? Okay, fine. Uh, so what are we doing here? Is we let us say we have an image. Okay, let us say this is an image and I want to convert this image into some kind of encoded uh, structure which is smaller in size yet it retains all the information over there. So when I have such kind of problem, what do we do? We always go ahead with convolutions. So what I will do, I will take a larger image, I will do convolutions max pooling, I will convert to it smaller. So just imagine the height is the dimension. I'm just reducing the dimension one by one all right so i'll do multiple layers of convolution convolution pooling convolution pooling such a way that i can say that the the information that is stored here i have shrunken it down to this much yeah this process is called encoding all right now what is the use of uh, these things where do we use this <clears throat> first of all it could be used to store so if in case you want to compress the images and store it, yes, you can do this. <clears throat> Second thing is there where there could be certain applications where a larger image or having a huge data multiplication not possible. So in that case, we will try to give this image and try to recreate something out of this back. That was nothing but auto encoders. Do people remember? We got, if you remember the numbers and all we had original image and the answer that we got was a very vague kind of down sampled or I can say vaguely sampled images. 
even though from the looking at the image we can make out the number so it was not so bad so whenever you want dimension reduction and all this thing could be possible but in today's case we are not looking for that application what we will do is i will now try to recreate this image back so any idea how can i do that so let me first put the figure so that from there you get to know what we are doing all right till i get back to the original dimension so what i am doing i am doing compression decompression so i can say this is encoding this could be decoding okay now my question to all of you is how we can do this how is it possible the convolution part you people got it we understood the possibility how you can do this let me show you guys something on the visual part of it so say i originally had a triangle all right now what i did um when i encoded it i encoded it to a smaller triangle say. yeah now my aim is to bring that triangle back such a way that it is almost similar to the original one something like this yeah how to do that very simple what you do is you start making you start so let us say there are some pixels okay so you expand those pixels say that might be this is my current range the nearby pixels also will be of a same range so this could be one operation on the top of that you do one more operation saying that okay let me expand this on the top of this say one more something like this so you keep expanding or going in reverse direction such a way that till you reach your original shape and size okay so this is your very basic concept but if you want to look at from image point of view let us say this is an m cross n image now what does this image have please remember only numbers nothing else now after encoding what what i am going to have let us say i have my encoded data as 2 cross 2 so it could be 1 uh, 2 uh, pixel numbers huh? 4 and 6 after encoding after going through multiple layers of convolution let us say we end up into this now how do i recreate it back so what i will do i will try to create something like a pad around it we'll start doing padding around here and in this padding what i will do let us say i add one layer of pad for example now when i add one layer of pad what's going to happen you will get new values right So what if I say that the points near to this will get this value? The points near to this will get this value. So this is four. This is four. This is four. Points near to this six, 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 one, one, one. Yeah. So now can I say yes? There are some numbers around it. Like this, I will keep increasing my values one by one. Yeah. Now this looks convincing over here. but are you able to find a problem here there could be some problem here if i do this there could be other components that might lie in this correct exactly so what i'm going to do because of using the same pixels i'm replicating the same color correct right yes so because of this issue so actually it looks like an issue but yes we have got a solution here so why is the solution so now keep this in mind this type of concept and we'll come back to this yeah so let me show you today's problem there could be certain times where you don't need to identify what is there in the image see in this image if you observe what all we can get out of this so if this image was passed through your yolo so your next week this week's week four content yolo will give you many object detection saying this is a house sky it will give you all the cars and you would have seen this kind of stuff on uh, youtube and linkedin also people posting it people are walking and yolo and ssd are able to identify them and uh, in the image yeah what else you can see you can see houses you can see a pole you can see a building lot of things you can see yeah sometimes our application does not need these kind of sophistication i will give you an example way let us say you are having um again coming back to your parking slot uh, 
problem. I think I have explained you earlier also. Let us say there are some parking slots which has sensors. Now sensors, putting a sensor there is very costly sometimes because of maintenance and all lot of issues, maintenance, hardware and all this. So what if I remove this sensor and I put a simple camera over there and this camera is connected to one of our uh, deep learning networks. Yeah. Now what it does is the camera captures an image of this slot. Now is it necessary for me to, let us say this, there is a car parked over here. Now the only intention to show here is whether this car park is full or empty, it has to detect and display it in a in a, in a display board down the line so that nobody comes and waste the time over here and go back. Yeah. So what is our job here is just to identify is there some object on this or not. What is the object, what color, what company, what type of car we are not interested in. Doing. So applications where you don't need to detect like this, but yes, you need to separate the object by color or by any of the other methods. You can say segmentation will be in use. So this is called semantic segmentation where you are trying to give a color to similar type of objects. Do you people see that all the cars are almost purple colored? Yeah, yes. all of these are almost red. Sky is one color, road is of one color, and because of the difference, this is one color, and the ground is of one color. Now, try to bring that un the uh, encoding decoding concept over here. So, what is going to happen now is we will make an algorithm such a way that if this color is red, if it is an encoded stuff, what I will do is I will see to it the neighboring stuff, neighboring. Uh, pixels to this also gets the same color, but in this case, our segmentation is giving purple color. Yeah, so I will see if this is purple, 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 purple. I will try to give purple ev almost everywhere till I find this image is in scope. Correct, and also you will see there are some borders you might find the color is coming apart from that. So, this is the way you can say that yes, the image could be encoded down, and then when you are decoding back, there are chances that we can get a very similar color around a simple object okay so this is a application of encoding decoding now you may ask me fine uh, apart from this parking slot where else you need it let us say you have you have you are working on this google uh, car self driving car so what does a car need to see a car has to do two things first of all it has to drive right now where will it drive obviously it has to find a road yeah now, if let us say this is the image given to the car, there could be lot of confusion. There could be one road going over here. The car will not come to know sometimes because of lot of objects present in the image. We are not sure. So what I will do for that time is to solve this problem. I will say I will put an algorithm saying that wherever I find a road, I first of all Google will see an image like this, and whenever there is a road, you might find one particular color. Follow that. I don't care about any other object around me. I only care about one thing which is road. That's it. Yeah. So there are algorithms in which we can, we can, we can blacken this up. So whatever you see here, no. So if, if I say, okay, I'm focusing only on the road part of it, I can, I can wipe this out into one color. Let us say whatever is not road is red color. Okay. Something like this. So imagine a picture where this is happening. So there are only two colors, one is red and one is black. So Google, the, the particular self-driving car will come to know that yes, that's all is my road. Now wherever I keep finding this black color, I will keep following. And there could be one more application on that if there is something on the road, it has to stop and manage the speed. In that case, you can say that yes, I have detected a person or I have detected a car like this or something. It should not be that much complicated as compared to the driving part. Yeah. So this is one example of semantic segmentation. Now there are various types of semantic segmentation. We have instance and we have semantic. So let's start with the semantic part. So as I said, if you observe here, there are two buses. Okay. So when the image was shrunken down and when we get back the image, what's going to happen is the, the, the pixels are going to you know, basically say that, okay, this is a part of the same family. Let us use the same color. So I, let us say this was my first pixel. One minute. Huh? This was my, could be my first pixel. Then I would have drawn a bracket around it. More same color pixel. More, more, more. 
Like that, I started increasing and I finally got wherever there is bus, if you observe, there is a green color. Wherever the bus is, there is no bus, it is followed by a black color. Correct? So I can easily come to know that when I take, when I look at this, there are two buses. That's it. So this is called semantic segmentation. And there is something called instant segmentation. Now in this also, if you want classification, because this is one type of bus, this is another type of bus. In that case, you can say this is double decker and this is a single. Okay. So all we need to do is, we need to have a very good corpus, that is your training uh, data. And we need to have your target data. Are you able to get it? We have to train them. First of all, saying that if if this is the scope, you have to do this. <clears throat> or if this is the scope, you have to do this. Wherever you find these kind of buses, you color them. So I need to have original images and I need to have target images. All right. Anything else possible here? Apart from these two. See, if, if in case you train the image saying that I just want to detect this. I don't want to detect this, the double decker. So in that case, this also will become black. This will be identified. Okay. So once you progress onto that, you can have a lot of other applications onto this. Any questions, guys? Now it is okay. So how does uh, this coloring happen or the corpus already has this color? So do we have to yes. also encode this classification? No, the corpus already has the color. So the corpus has both the images. It has the original image and it has got the uh, encode, uh, encode decoded image also. Yeah, plus mm -hmm. we will use a unit onto this to train them. All right. I'll show you down the line in the case study. Sir, what is mask? This is mask. These images are called mask. These images are called original uh, images. Okay. All right. Yeah. So we'll move ahead. So, okay. So this is what I was trying to explain. But, uh, okay, we will see this in unit. So I don't want to confuse you guys with heavy maths and all. Now, moving so, on. I do have one more question. Uh, yeah. okay. hmm. uh, can we go back to that screen? Yeah. Yeah. How do we start initially, uh, like taking the center point or center pixel and then trying to do yeah. that uh, segmentation or? Yes. So for that, I need to do unit first. If okay. you look at the unit structure, what are we doing now is, if you people remember, if I ask you guys one simple question, if this is my original image, and this is my convoluted image. What can you say about these two? What is, what is present in the convoluted image? <clears throat> can somebody tell me this? What does convolution feature map represent? It shows the parameter. Correct. The, can I say the most important parameter? Mostly and. Uh... Correct. Yeah. The images are actually, the entire image is broken down into different parameters. Correct. Yeah. So we'll have a list of filters available with us. Agreed? And what are these? These are one of the most important features per filter. Right? So just imagine that an image <clears throat> is broken down into a very simple encoded part. So just imagine this is a small a list, or I can say a, a combination of lot of convoluted filters. So can I say these are, these are one of the most important features from the image? Remaining stuff we don't, we don't much care about it. Correct? Next what I do is if you observe, now we are upscaling. So we are picking up each filter. And as I showed you people, that if this is one filter, pad it up. So if you observe the size of this and size of this, definitely there is an increase in this. So by padding, what are we doing? If you remember max pooling, in max pooling what you did? Out of two, out of these four, we'll pick out the maximum feature. So we'll do reverse of this. We will say that instead of max pulling it, we will replicate this by the same pixel. So if the pixel number is one, that means it represents a color. This also I will put the same number. All right. So this is the way we are expanding. So now if you go back to that bus, let us say in that bus part, if this was, if this was one of the filters, let us say, uh, let me 
pull out a color. Let us say if this was one of the convoluted filters. So what would have happened? The color which is represented here will be replicated round the line. But from the training part, we have pushed that this should be the color. So in that case, green color will be put on to the complete box that you see. So it will be now completely green color. Now I will go to the next one. I will do the same job. I will go to the next filter. I will do the same job. All right. So when I come here, when I come here, it has been learned that if this is not the object that we are looking for, this is something else. It has been learned that it is from the black side. So whatever is there, you replace it by black. All right. So this is how they do it. So this is a very ideal image I've shown you. So today in the case study, you will actually come to know it is not this accurate. If you observe here, there is a line, exact same line. It is not very accurate to be very frank. But yes, you will be able to pull out separate objects. Okay. Amit, is it okay? Fine. You, you getting the concept now? Who, who asked that question? It was Amit. Yes. Yep. Yeah? All right. Krishna, although I just have one question, uh, Krishna, on this image. Yes. Yeah, Amit. Yeah, how does the corpus actually identify the two objects? Like if you see the both bus are actually ah. having so, a correlation or a overlap, right? And there is a clear line drawn between the two buses separating the two. Correct. So in this case, um, a very good question. I also have never thought about it. Uh, what What is my take is somebody was kind enough to use unit and give us the best segmentation so this is our tag and this is our image this is what i take it up but it's a good question how does the do it so the person who has made the corpus had a very good unit design such a way that he got the outputs as this and then he's tagging for us so we'll do one thing in one of our sessions so once we are we are good with uh, unit and all these things we will try to use rather than using corpus we are rather than using target data We'll try to use one of these images and generate this. Oh, Krishna, even I learned that, uh, I mean, I, I read somewhere that segmentation tools are available. So uh, while preparing the, you know, corpus, they use those tools to, you know, actually make the segmentations for, uh, for anyone to, uh, you know, uh, okay. tra train and practice. Okay. So let's see. Uh, anyway, I was in talks with grade learning onto that. Uh, I don't, I think I discussed last time also with you guys. I don't want you guys to depend on somebody's corpus. So I was talking with some senior people there saying that let's uh, try to have an industry session on how we can generate our own embeddings. So whenever you do not have corpus data, but at least you have some kind of images or some kind of text in an entry, how to tag them up, not manually, automatically, so that you can generate your own corpus. Yeah, there are tools, uh, sorry, there are libraries available for that. Let me see if I can push this also into it. Okay. So probably by the end of our CV, let me see if I can code it up and show it to you. Yeah. Fair enough. We'll go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So now. Yeah. All right. All right. So moving on. So this is what is unit. Uh, again, I would say uh, give some time to this. These are not straightforward things, and if they were, then uh, <clears throat> it won't be uh, you know you will not find a very handful of people who are actually working on units. You know, they can design the unit without any references and issues. So uh, this is what is unit, and if you observe, this is not only one part. Like this, this is not the only possible solution. You can mix match lot of convolutions, all stuff over here too move and you have to make your own unit but please be careful sometimes what happens is uh, image let us say in this case is of this size the image that we got out could be of a different size so if you are expecting that image is perfect a replica of it and all then you need to design it such a way that all this basically this and this should exactly match with each other you know opposite of that that is what we did in auto encoders all right but in this case it is not perfect it is like some size and output is going on the same side Okay. Good. So why do they uh, trying to match the input versus the output? 
so krishna if you want to try to match input to output mm-hmm. is there any way we can use uh, resnet for that or uh, yes is yes. this always doing uh, it by this up sampling itself that it takes the input um, output okay so for today's case study amit what i have done is I, i i think you are very near to that what i have done so i am using resnet as my uh, propagation uh, network so what i am doing now is first i am bringing unit and putting my data on unit and post that i am using resnet to transform so to make my image of one size and my segmentation image of same size basically get my point mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. And, so I'm and combining all together. Yeah. And so we, I will show you in our case study. Basically, I'm also trying to get that cost net of uh, jumps. Okay. Okay. So I think in your case study, it will be more clear. I guess. Yes. Exactly. So you can combine. So it's not always necessary that I'll only use unit. You can use ResNet or something like that too. Have lot of uh, replications, and finally we make sure we get the image of same size. Or, in other case, you can use my logic from auto encoders. The auto encoders, the very simple logic. Whatever is here is over here. Whatever is a shape and size here is a shape and shape and size here. That's it. All right. Now, one question to all of you: Is it necessary for me to match the shape and size? Let us say if you are designing that uh, parking sensor that I told you, is it necessary for me to? Match it up, or it's okay. It depends upon the case study. I suppose uh, okay. it's like uh, image. Uh, if we are trying to only detect the object, then I don't think it's important that the size should be same. However, if uh, hmm. okay, so if you're uh, like uh, hmm. trying yeah. to identify the sh- by the shape and size itself, then hmm. I think it is. Correct. It depends upon the case. I I think it's important because in the end we are concatenating uh, the leftmost layer to the right. Correct. So both of these answers are perfectly right. First thing is true. It depends on what application you are using. If if your application does not need much pre- precision, you know, you can. Mm-hmm. It's okay. Do you don't have to because adding extra layers is an extra cost for us, right? So rather than doing that, we'll be happy with some image where I can see something visually and take a decision on it. Uh, and some of the cases, yes, it is very important to have an exact image. So I will give an example of that too. So recently, these things are now used in cancer detection and all that. So what they do now is, let us say they have taken some uh, photos of some of these cells. Okay, and now the Let us say the doctor wants to understand which of these cells are cancerous, which of them are not. So, what if I can use this uh, these things to locate certain part of that image, saying that this is my cancered one, and whatever is around it, the black zone. So, whatever is there, definitely there are cells around it, but we are not interested. Where is it? Now, if the image is not of the same dimension and all this, thing, there will be a lot of issue in identifying the place. Basically. All right. So in those cases, yes, I agree, it is needed exact replication. Sometimes we don't need it. So you, whenever you are designing this, take a decision on 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 your on on how do you say depending on your application. All right, good. Uh, now coming to mobile net. So what I will do, I will first we will look at the case study, and then we'll come on to the mobile net. So mobile net is again a different part. Yeah. So I will actually mobile net. We will do a lot of math today. I'll show you how I can reduce my number of multiplications from VGG or normal convolutions to mobile units. All right. Okay. So now let me start my case study here. Yeah. So just for starting purpose, what are we going to do today is we have got a set of images like this. Okay. Just let me reload it. Yeah. The whole intention today will be to zoom in. Yeah. Let us say this is one image that I have. Okay. Now I want to find out. Say, uh, I want to convert them into some kind of mask or some kind of segmentation. Yeah. 
But if you observe here, there are so many objects. So there is a car, there are some buildings, there is some, uh, uh, what do you say, vegetation over here, there are pathways, there is a road, there is sky, a lot of things is there. And also this image is not that clear. Why? Because I've used 128 cross 128. That's the only issue. Otherwise, if I use 1024 cross 1024, it would have been better. But at the end of the day, what is my intention? My intention is to convert it to like this. Very simple. So uh, why do I need this? Let us say the forest or uh, I'll say environment department wants to know how much vegetation is present on each road. So if you look at this, it clearly shows us that overview that, yeah, there's a good amount of trees present over here, for example. Or as, uh, how, what is the current traffic level at particular uh, time of the day? So I don't want to, you know, basically look at other objects. I just want to look at my car and uh, the road. So in that case, you can just look at it. Yeah. So this is what is uh, the purpose of today's case study, where we convert this to this, as simple as that. Or if I go down and show you some of the outputs, I want to convert this particular image to this image. Okay. Now, uh, from one of my other batches, I got a very good question that um, uh, what if we can map up? So, how are these colors coming up? First of all, these colors are coming up because this is my original image, okay, and this is my mask image, or I can say my tagged image. So, already somebody has provided us. So, from this, we are getting the mappings. But yeah, so the purple color for the road is coming from something like this: the learnings. So what I'm going to do now is they ask me, okay, fine, if we can find some kind of relationship between the colors in the original and the colors in the segmentation should be good. So yes, I will show you guys something next week or next to next week. So I'll start coding onto that. Uh, and I will show you guys how, what is the relationship between the color and, this, and how these guys have done. But overall in, in this case study, it is all dependent on our mask image or tag image. All right. So now let's start. So this is the place where you can download the, the data set from. And for our collab people, if you can use the above code, I will start from here. So the first thing is I have to define my shape and size. So now one question to all of you. Let us say I have defined 128 cross 128. Or else if some of you would have done it, say 256 cross 256. Or one of you, let us say having GPU has done 1024 cross 102. Will it make some kind of difference on the quality of my output or no? Color will be a little bit uh, changed or uh, there will be blur or hue in that. Perfect. So whatever extra spills that we are seeing, no, you will not be able to see that because if the image has more samples or more pixels, the difference between the colors will be farther. Yeah. So please remember that uh, to choose an optimal image size So I have for ease. Because my epochs otherwise will die over here. So for ease, I have chosen 128, 128. When you get this code, try on a higher dimension also. Nothing wrong. Next is, uh, I'm listing all the set of images that are present in my training images. That means my original images, this ones. Yeah. So if I look at it, this is how it looks like. Now, why is it important? Because here, the person who has prepared the data has given the same name to the original image. And the same name goes into the so mask image. So if you observe here, I'm printing printing the original image and the mask image. Original image, mask image. So when I do that, if you observe, the names are perfectly seen. So that we'll come to know which is the target image or the how do I say reference image for the original one. So this is original, this is mask. Yeah. So the first thing that I have to do is just to keep a check, everything is good. I have to sort both of these. So this is my Independent set of data. This is my target set of data. Correct. So if I sort both of them, common sense is going to come to uh, same name. So basically, we will we'll be able to put it in same hierarchy. All right. Next, uh, we are using OpenCV. So OpenCV is uh, again is a library which is could be used for a lot of uh, importing images, printing images, and all this part of it. And uh, here for displaying part, I'm using simple uh, uh, this thing, uh, matplot. The first thing that I have to do is I have to now differentiate X and Y. So guys, one more thing. There are various ways in which you can do segmentation. Please remember, there is not one way. I am showing you an easy way to do it. I am not showing you a heavy manual way. 
there is there could be one more way beyond this where in seven eight lines of code you will be able to finish it all right so the videos that you are seeing on your olympus that that could be one possible way this could be one possible way and in future if you read some of the blogs where it's very simple that also could be so the way we are taking you through various uh what do you say uh, approaches is so that you are comfortable with almost everything but I will still prefer have a simplistic version. I don't want you guys to write all manual stuff. Input the data, then concatenate. Fine, that is good to understand. But once you have got your understanding, don't do this. Come on to the industry side and write simple, straightforward quotes. Okay. So here, the first thing that I am doing now is I am saying this is my independent data. This is my target data. Now, first of all, I am creating empty lists or sorry, empty NumPy arrays which are full of zeros, okay? What should be the length of it? How many of them I want it? It should be exactly in size equivalent to our mask and original. So this is, there is a folder called original, there is a folder called mask, and all the images are stored in these. So total number of images, how many I have, I want that many number of matrices. Inside that matrix, what should be the row and column width? Should be 128 cross 128. And do you want color? I will say yes. So put it three. Okay, sort of. Now, did you see that? I manually imputed this. Yes, yes, I got it. Perfect. So you can import an image and then say while giving it to our networks, you can define them as your channels. All right. Okay. And what I need, I need a, let us say the data type should be float. So now I have got two arrays full of zeros of this dimension. So this is something like your HDF where there are a lot of images of 128 cross 128 size okay moving on the first thing that i have to do is i have to give the index of my file so what is the first index let us say index is zero or minus one whatever is the original index next is what is where it is located so i'll give my path after that i will import it so from this particular path read one image and load it in the form of image in a for loop so i will go around this for loop for how many times for the number of images that are present in the folder original okay after that i will say try if resizing this image using opencv to 128 cross 120 okay normalize it next is your mask so we have read the original image now i'm reading the mask part of it in the mask, what you do is do the same concept. Read it, resize it, and normalize it. Perfect. And if you have expect, uh, exceptions, go back to the original part. This is what it means. The so first try this, still nothing is possible. Move ahead with the next one. All right, but so far we did not get any exception, so it's okay. Any idea where we will get this exception? I hope you people got the second part. What do I mean by exceptions? For example, say there are 200 original images, that means your in, uh, independent data, and there are 199 target images. What is going to happen? Or mask, I will say in this case. What's going to happen? This is not going to run for sure. It's going to give you error. If it gives an error, there's an exception. Go back and check the path. So it will show you that there is an exception E. And plus it will give us the path as simple as that. This is the issue. This is the place where error has occurred. Yeah. Now moving on, if you look at the shape and size of X and Y, 200 images we have in total, 128 cross 128 cross RGB. Now we'll try to pull out one image. So I am dot show. Let us say first one. So this is how it looks like. And the same Y of it, when you print here, you get it like this. Good. So far, so good. Any questions? Uh, is exception uh, is inbuilt to Python or we are defining that? No, it is inbuilt in this. Okay. Okay. Good. So moving on. So exception is part of NumPy or kind of library? See, it is something like I can say, do we import anything for if else? For loop? While? Do we import no. anything? No. So this is inbuilt part of I can say 3.7. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, still let me check. I am because I I have not come across this question earlier, and even I have not thought of it. I directly use it basically. From oh, base. Let, sorry. It's from base Python package. Hmm. Correct. All right. So this is it. If in case this was, you wouldn't have used try and accept, for example. What else we can use from the coding part? Let us say I don't want to use try and accept. Then what I could have done? Can I say if, yeah, this particular image, so whatever I have downloaded, if image is equal to true, agreed? If it is true, do this. That's it. Correct or not? So if there is some value into it, definitely it's going to show you true. And if it is true, enter. If it is not true, it will not even go. Alright, so if you want, if anybody wants to simplify it, you can do this way. Okay, good. So now moving on. Okay, uh, also was trying to show you just in case how the original image looked like. The original image was 375 cross 1242 cross 3. So that was the reason we make it to 128 cross 128 standard one. So if you observe, we are losing certain data if I'm not wrong here. So, if you look at this image and if you look at this image, so what is the difference between both the images is, there is one car which is over here which has been cropped because of uh, our thing plus, I think this particular ground is shown over here. Yeah, and this one if you observe has been shrunk. And there is a tree present here which is again chopped up. So, please be careful. Uh, try to find out the optimal shape and size of it and then choose 128 or 256 and all. Now you may ask me fine, how do we come to it? Uh, what you can do is you can use the max function, something like that. Find out, use a for loop to go through each and every image and find out the maximum out of it. Which image is having maximum size and which image is having minimum size. Then you can go ahead and choose about it. That whether you will pad the minima image or you will remove the stuff from the maximum image. So just ignore this. I was just trying across. I got some black image. So ignore it. Now comes the concept of transferred learning. So from our last week, if you people remember, we did a transferred learning on VGG. Correct. Any questions onto that? I just want to know where can we find all this. Uh weights or if you want to download and use it because we saw VPC net uh, Correct. was imported, right? Correct. So I will do one thing in this case is uh, I will compile one small Excel file and I will give you all the links from where you can download all these weights as of now. But then every three months you people go and keep checking whether the link is active or not. Alright? Okay, so we'll do that. So for our uh, unit basically for our segmentation model, we are getting from this particular command. All right. So it will take some time. So please be patient here. It will take some time, and sometimes it might throw you errors. I'm not sure. For me, for the first time, yes, it threw me error. What I did was I restarted my kernel, and from a fresh uh, Python uh, this thing, I did it. Uh, or else you can use pip3, or you can use conda, whatever you like it. More or less, this should work. If it is not working on any of you, do let me know. Okay, we will try to solve it up. So I'll ping you right away. If you want in the break part, you can just try downloading it. Okay, good. Now moving on. So what are we getting now? So first of all, we are having a segmentation model. From there, we are importing unit. Okay. So what is a segmentation model? What we imported here. Okay. Next is uh, from segmentation models, we are importing backbones. Now this is a new concept to you guys. Backbone is a network which will run on the backside of your original network. So let us say in this case my backbone is ResNet, but my original network is a combination of uh, unit and fully connected, for example. Yeah, so I'll show you. We'll see down the line how the architecture and all happens in this. Next is, uh, I usually use both of them, so I have manually copied it, but we are not using Jacquard loss and IOU over here. So. If I explain you what is Jacquard loss, is a type of loss function which we use in optimizers. And what is IOU? Um, it's very simple. Let us say this is one image. 
and uh, let us say this is one triangle so you are designing one computer vision code where you are supposed to tag the object so let us say the person who has designed the corpus has tagged it like this all right okay okay one minute i'll tag it too thick it will not help me today let me tag it a little thinner so let us say this is your triangle and if I go back and tag it, change the color. Let us say the person who has designed it has tagged exactly, perfectly tagged it. Now when you ran your algorithm, whatever you have designed onto it, let me change the color. So you tagged it like this. So your algorithm was able to tag this as the object. Yeah. Now, how do you find how good is your tagging? So for that, what we'll do is we will use the concept of intersection over union. That means, do people see that both of these boxes are intersecting at one point? Are you able to see those box? The intersection area divided by the whole union area. Right. So let us say the intersection area is 90 percent and the whole union area was 120. For example, because of this extra stuff, we can say it's more. So in this case, we can say that yes, the model performance is designed by this one. So this is the accuracy score that we use for object detections. It's not in our this module, but yes, in next week's module, you will be seeing this. I will be seeing. Next, we are having Keras. So we are having input convolution, and we are defining Keras model to get our uh, to define our models. Next thing is you split your test and train data as simple. Uh, we could have done it earlier also. Yes, I think I would have forgotten it. So we have to put it over here. We usually do it before starting your network. The first thing that I'm doing here is I'm bringing ResNet. Now, any issues understanding ResNet? Do people remember last week's session ResNet? What is the use of ResNet basically? Think about it. Take two minutes. It has an automatic back propagation. It compares the input at any time during the output and it's capable of jumping. Correct. I want that jumping factor. Can I say there are certain time chances that you will get early outputs. Your output will not travel through all the layers. It will, but the first output that you get might be a very faster output. Agreed? Okay. So in that case, if I want it, this could be a very complicated yet easy network to put it across this. So this will give me some kind of speed, I can say. Now tomorrow, if you don't like ResNet 34, you can put ResNet 52. Now what do you mean by ResNet 34? You have 34 different D players. That's it. 52 means you have 52 D players. And then you are bypassing each other. Something like that. All right. So my backbone is currently ResNet. So what I'm going to do is whatever unit whatever output unit gives me, it will propagate through my ResNet. All right, for my classification, to be very uh, simple. If you don't want to use backbone, it's okay. I just give you an option here that even you can do this rather than using a, a single network. All right, so if you are not comfortable for now, you remove it. And later on, when you're comfortable with the unit, bring back the backbone concept and use it. Next thing is your uh, training part of it. So whatever I have defined on ResNet as my process input, I have to put my train and validation data on it. Agreed? In last, uh, if you remember in last uh, case study, last week's case study, we had transferred learning concepts. So what we did, we had a network. Some of the weights we bought ready-made. Some of the weights we did changes. So this was your FCNN and this was your VGG. Correct? So what did we do with these weights? Anybody remembers how we manipulated these weights or how we made sure that we are not changing in back propagation? We pre-multiplied the... Exactly. We pre-processed it using our X data. So it's the same thing, kind of thing we are doing it over here. We are saying that I do not want to manipulate the weights over here because it's a ready-made ResNet 34 backbone network. Okay. Look at the shape of uh, my training data 170, validation data 30, same 128, 128, 3. 
Now coming to your unit. So guys, this is the simplest way you can define it. It works perfectly. You might find various architectures where this goes pretty complex. Okay, I welcome that, no issues. But I'll say, don't jump onto that immediately. Start with something simple and then move up, All right? So anyway, today's uh, case study, we are getting an accuracy of only 54. So anyway, I'll ask you guys to improvise this. I will, you will see to it how you guys can do it. All right. So the first thing that I'm now doing is giving my training shape of my first train data, the shape of my first training image to N, storing it as N. And later on, I'm bringing that over here as my input shape to my unit. Okay. Now. After backbone, I'm saying this is my base model. What is my base model? Unit. From where I got unit? From segment models. What is segmentation models that we downloaded? Live. All right. So this is how the connection is coming. So from unit, I'm saying my backbone name is nothing but inception version 3. So if you remember, inception 1 was one of the architectures. And the weights that we are putting onto that is ImageNet weights. What is this image net? We saw this last session, right? If not, just go and check the PPT again. You will find out. I'm not sure. I'm not uh, saying that, okay, always you have to do this. You can build in your own uh, different versions also. Not a problem. So, Inception, we so, think the ID, yeah. So why do we use Inception here? Uh, backbone. Uh, see, it, if, if you see here, the comments I have written is, there is a proof that Inception uh, is, a, is, is probably highly trained and on an average it gives us around 78% of accuracy on using ImageNet together. So basically when I combine these two, uh, we are getting this thing. So this is one combination. If you don't want this way, you can use say VGG and uh, for, for weights, VGG already has inbuilt weights. So you can do that. Yeah. So this is an open option to all of you saying that either you use this or you use one of the other networks that we have designed. LXNet could be used, no problem. VGG could be used, no problem. One of my learners said I want to use Google uh, stuff. I said fine, all the best. Your hardware should be really good for that because if you remember the Google stuff was very heavy. Alright, so this is a very simple way of combining it and getting an accuracy of this one. But in our case study, we have not achieved 70%. We have achieved around 54. All right. So in yeah, this I seven, was just trying to conceptualize uh, how does the combination work? That's what I yes intended. To yes. So in this seven weeks of our computer vision, this is what we are going to do. Every case study, we will find some new combinations so that by the end of five six weeks, you will be able to get it. All right. Okay, so this is my input I'm giving. Next one is my layer. So let us say I am defining my layer number one. I'm convoluting it to dimension convolution 2D. Next thing is I'm saying there are three filters. Each one is one cross one. Okay, on what we are applying on your input. Then comes my output. So this is my base model. So whatever model I'm using unit, so I'm using my unit onto my layer number one. All right. After that, layer number two. So I'm again doing convolution, three uh, kernels, one cross one each on our output uh, channel. And finally, I'm implementing my Keras model. I'm saying bring out my Keras model on my input with respect to my L2. So I'm saying this is my input and this is what I'm supposed to bring it out. Name of uh, the model that is going to run is nothing but your unit, your base model. Okay. And uh, post that and printing the summary. So if you look at the summary, there are no parameters in input as of such. There are 12 parameters in output. Okay. And uh, uh, next thing is when we are bringing the unit, okay, using inception v3, we are having a huge number of parameters here. All right. So if from this parameters, we can say that these many parameters are non-trainable, a very fixed version, and these parameters are trainable out of this. Okay. Now, if you ask me, fine, how did we get it? Since we are getting ready-made material, I have no control over this, which is a non-trainable, which is trainable, since we are getting a ready-made part of it. Right. 
So this is how the network, uh, this is how the summary looks like. And if you want to look the summary of the base model, your base model is nothing but your unit. Just look at the size of the unit. It is very heavy. All right. So we cannot, it is impossible from our side to manually code this or manually construct it. So we do transfer them. Now coming to uh, running our optimizers and uh, defining them. So what are we doing is we are uh, if we are having binary cross entropy, we'll use Adam and I, I will use TF uh, TensorFlow to do some calculations onto our uh, accuracy function or matrix function. So the first thing that I will do now is, if you remember our uh, optimizer, what all we used to put? We used to put the name of it, then we used to put a loss function. So what I've done now is we have defined our own loss function. You can use the standard ones also. No issues, but in this case, say just to show you guys, it is possible to define it. We have done it. And second thing, we have defined our own dice coefficient. So this is something like your accuracy. So you remember I showed you IOU concept, intersection over union. You know that the one which I showed you about. Multiply our predicted versus uh, actual and divided by the union of it, for example. Okay, and we'll use TF to reduce the sum. So, if in case uh, there is a huge amount, we'll try to reduce it and narrow down the stuff. Or else, even you can put um, uh, what do you say? How do we reduce decimals, guys? What is the function for decimals? Um, if I have 3.2468, if I want to reduce it to 2, 3.24, what is the function we use? Round exactly. Yeah, so you can use a round function to do that, or else a simple version of tf will be tf dot reduce underscore sum. So we will come back to this special kind of accuracies and losses once we go down we deep into this. Uh, so probably in fifth and sixth week we'll we'll come back and revisit this topic. But for now, just imagine this is your matrix, and using the same thing we are defining our loss. Okay. Now you may ask, okay, what is this uh, epsilon? Epsilon is nothing but 10 power minus 7. Yeah. So this is my loss. This is my coefficient. I will call it whenever I compile my back propagation. Okay. That's it. And finally, I'm fitting my model. All right. On to when defining also my validation data, 100 epochs. It took a lot of time for me. On collab, I think you guys will be pretty fast. Batch size, I've taken say approximately 13. Use it more to be faster. Uh, and I think this is all you people know. So if you observe here, instead of accuracy now, I'm having my dice coefficients, right? So that is 54. And for validation, dice coefficient is 53.9. That is again 54 itself. So the model is stable, but I feel it is not that accurate. Yeah. So there could be one reason. The first reason is we have done 128 cross 128. First reason. Probably there is a lot of pixels which are shrunk. So what if I can increase the size of this? So please remember. Try doing that and then report back what accuracy you got. Second reason could be, um, I will say, number of um, epochs that we are running. Yeah. So if you observe, there is not much change. I agree to that. But retry running more epochs, you should be able to move ahead. Okay. So this is it. Uh, so this is the problem I am giving you guys. Try to solve it up and let me know how much you are able to pull it up to. But do it only in collab. Otherwise, on Jupiter, you have to wait a lot of time. Yeah. Even though it's showing three seconds and 15 milliseconds and all, but yes, ending up takes a lot of time. So till here, it might run fast. The last epoch will take a lot of time. Hey guys, have you seen that? I'm not sure if you have noticed on Jupiter. The last epoch, no? The ETA will show, say, zero seconds, but still it will be running and it will not come out of the execution loop. Any idea what is happening here? Observe it. If you have not observed it, try observing that. Okay. <clears throat> so there is some delay probably, I feel. Even though we are getting a number over here, but yeah, there could be a delay. Now moving on. Um, or else one more thing, um, just in case if anybody is very much interested in timing it, there is a function called TQDM. I have shown you guys this earlier also. 
you can use TQDM here. TQDM is a very effective way of noting your time. You come to know how much time your uh, epoch took to run. Finally, uh, we are predicting it. So when I run my prediction model, so we'll come back to saving the weights later. So when I'm doing my prediction on our model, so whatever I get as my, let us say I printed the original image and this is the predicted image. If you observe and if your intention here is to just to find road, then yes, you can say that you have got a very good color. But the problem I see here is there are some vehicles on the road and because of our low accuracy, even they are of similar color. So this is going to be a problem. So let us say if you are running car on this, Google car is running this, it will not be able to identify this. It is going to go and bang basically. Yeah. So try to improvise it and see if we can. All right. Now coming to an important concept of uh, storing your weights. I think I have done this all already. Something new I am showing you guys as uh, JSON. So you have four options available. Joblib, Pickle, JSON and HBA. You can use any of these to store the weights so that tomorrow when you open the code again, you need not to run this. You can directly load your model or your weights directly from this. So all you need to do is, next time when you run this code, you need to say, let us say, new underscore underscore model. And when you do that, what you can do is, you can say, um, h5 dot loads or load, it can be loads or load, just check it out. And in that, you can give the name of the file, which is nothing but our model.h5. Right? So this is going to load the complete findings onto new model. And from next time, you can say new underscore model dot predict. And inside that, whatever is your image, you can give. That's all. All right? So that's the reason we use this. So you don't have to re keep retraining your data. So this was a simplistic version of industry-based unit. Let's move on to uh, a new type of network. Uh, and we'll try to reduce uh, some of the computations out of uh, our convolution and all. Let's see if I can uh, re uh, reduce the number of computations. So to do that, now my first question is, um, say you have a phone, for example, and in this phone, say you have clicked a picture and the functionality in your phone is it can detect certain objects. So let us say, first of all, it detects your face and from now, every picture you take, it's going to detect it as you. Nowadays, almost every phone has it. Yeah. Now, first question is, how do you think what type of algorithm will be running in the phone? So please make sure that uh, this phone is having some kind of RAM, some kind of storage and some kind of say, I will say graphics card or whatever you call it, right? So how exactly this, this image processing is happening here? Any idea? Do you think we'll be able to load VGG and all onto this? No. No? Correct? Why? Because how many parameters were there in VGG? If I'm not wrong, it was around 60 million parameters, right? So even if I pickle it or even if I, you know, try to load, uh, no, basically take the weights and make it a, a pickle file or some kind of function that from tomorrow when you just run it, it is going to run, right? It is not possible to have it on a handheld device. Now, let's see, still these stuff, these people, they do it. So now let's, there is a need of an algorithm. Okay. which is a lightweight of uh, convolution. It is a convolution, <clears throat> but could be a lighter weight. So let's try to reduce the, so let us say if I, I, I say if I reduce the number of parameters <coughs> by say 95%, then you think the phone will be capable enough to load it up? I will say yes. Correct. Right. So let's see. So this gives us a need of a new network. So we will define it as mobile network. 
So the compressed version or a very simple version of our complex models is this. Now, if somebody can help me out, say I don't want to show you screenshots. So what I'm doing now is let's try to build this up in a very, 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 so uh, this is something like um, revisiting our uh, concept of, uh, how do you say, <clears throat> revisiting the concept of uh, convolution plus you will derive the uh, mobile okay so say this is my image and this is an m cross n image yeah three channel m cross n image so just imagine that these are the number of channels in total okay now what do we do onto that we multiply it with some kind of filters correct so let's try to define the shape and size of all of these. So let us say you have got um, image uh, height of say df and image width of df. And then you have got some kind of channels here which are nothing but m. Is everybody okay with this figure? This is how an image looks like in Python. Agreed? Yes, yes. Yes, perfect. Now let us say this is a filter. So I define say dk cross dk as a filter size. It's always a squared part of it. Yeah. Now, what will be my output? So when I take this through multiple layers of convolution, max pooling and all, let us say my output looks something like this, say diminished version, but I will have a lot of feature maps. Agreed? So let me join them up. One. Two, all right so let us say the size of this feature map is dg cross dg cross n all right this is what we do in convolution everybody agrees so can i write here convolution happens here and at the end we are getting n filters out of it yeah so when you put n filters onto that at the end of the day we are getting dg cross dg cross n, right? Total number of feature maps. Krishna, mm -hmm. can you explain it once more? I just got a little bit confused. Sure, sure, sure. See, just think of it of one convolution uh, operation, wherein this is the shape and size of my image. Say it's a squared image. So in our case, in our case study, we just saw it is 128 cross 128 cross 3. So this is 128, 128, 3. All right. Now what are we doing? We are putting filters. So what was the filter size we took? We took three filters. Each one was one cross one. Agreed? So this is one cross one and this is three. So when I multiply these two, I convolute them. What are we going to get? We are going to get some image as an output. Agreed? Which is dg cross dg. Some dimension. We don't know. And how many of them will be there? exactly equivalent to how many filters you are using agreed okay, okay. so okay. now my output will be what dg into dg into n this will be my total size of my output what is the size of my input df into df into m okay size of my filter dk into dk right so let's build that map over here. So now so, let me. So DJ, the dimension of DJ, the output DJ is, uh, cannot be determined. Like it can be anything. Like there's no mathematical. Uh, no, 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 no. There is a mathematical formula. Do you remember that formula we did? Um, what was it? A shape of my width of my image minus width of my filter plus two times of padding divided by stride. Okay, okay, yeah, I, I got it. Yeah, this was the output form. All right. Okay. It is there in our week one PPT. Please uh, store it. Have a look at it once. Now, if I ask you guys, so let's build some equation here. If I ask you guys, question? No. Okay. If I ask you guys, what does one convolution multiplication look like? Can somebody tell me? One multiplication looks like dk square dk into dk cross m times. Agreed? Okay. 
how many multiplications you are going to do with respect to total number of kernels. How do we de de determine that? dg square, dg into dg, dg square into what? dk square, total number of the dimension of my kernels into total number of filters that I am having. Agreed? So this is how one convolution works out. Look at it, how heavy it will be. So if the size of my dimension is 1024, just imagine how heavy it's going to be. Agreed? So this is where our mobiles and handheld devices will not perform good or they will become little slow because of this. So please remember, convolution is nothing but multiplication. Yeah? I will say multiplication is heavy. Then what could be light? If I want a lighter version of it, what mathematical function should I put? Right? Think about it. If I am saying multiplication is pretty heavy for me, there should be some mathematical function which should be a little lighter version of this. Okay. Sir, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, my question through here is multiplications are heavy. Do you agree with this? This is a heavy task. Do you agree? If the image size is in megapixels, do you think this is going to take this is going this is going this is going to be immediate? No. Actually, you said here in one call multi layer, there are dk square into m number of weights or dimensions. Hmm. M number of channels. Yeah, right. M number of channels. Hmm. But so, yeah. I studied uh, somewhere that uh, in convolution, uh, the weights we are defining are uh, lesser as compared to fully connected layers. Okay. So you are saying that uh, in in first convolution we are getting dk square into m number of weights. Yes. But according to me, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there are n filters, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm not talking about the final answer. I'm just saying if my f my one filter goes and gets multiplied with one filter, uh, Dhruv, if one filter goes and gets multiplied with the image, this is how it's going to look like. What if I have got n filters as per you? So in that, yeah. they are going to multiply n again. Yeah, right. N Correct? Correct. So this, I meant one multiplication actually. I forgot to write one. So if one multiplication is this heavy, imagine n multiplications, how heavy they will be. Correct? So my point over here was just to show you guys that this is a heavy stuff which can be done on GPUs, but not on handheld devices. So now, what if I replace our mathematical function with something else? Can I say plus could be one option? Agreed? If I have additions, if I want to add 1024, Cross 1024. I know you will say, okay, fine, it's it's one cycle only. I agree to it. But 1024 square into say 650, whatever, 6012 square, this becomes still heavy. The number, the total number of parameters and all this part. Yeah. So what if I can say that okay, let me introduce something into plus, and what if we are able to reduce the uh, size of it? So for this reason, what we'll do is we will come to a new concept called depth wise separable convolutions depth this is a convolution only no change but the way we do it will alter it depth wise separable convolutions okay now let's see now this thing is divided into two steps so the step uh, we will put step number one so the first step is called Depth wise convolution. Depth wise convolution. Now, from the name, is anybody able to find out what it is? What do you mean by depth in, 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 in image? Channels. Perfect channels. Yes? Perfectly answered. Channels. So, what if now I have. DF and DF. So this is the dimension of my uh, thing. 
and m is number of channels I'm having. Okay, and um, what I'm going to do is my ultimate solution will be so when I convolute it, what's going to happen? I'm going to get convolution will remain same. There is no change to it. So I'm going to get some n uh, uh, images over here or filter maps over here, something like this. But the only change I will do is. I have not defined my filter yet. So if I define my filter right away, then you guys will come to know what is the difference in depth cut. So let us say my filter size is dk cross dk, for example. Okay. And I am saying that I will df and dk will be perfectly same. The shape of these two will be perfectly same. So when I get my output, it will be dg cross dg cross m. Did you get it? I have m channels. So how many times I have to go through? If I'm saying the size of df and dk is almost similar, that means I'm taking the whole depth as one filter. I have to just run three times. Agreed? So if I come to the math now, so whatever bracket we did in the above one, if I do the math for this, if you ask me what is one multiplication look like, one multiplication will look like dk square agreed multiplication per channel so if i have a multiplication per channel how it is going to look like it is going to look like dg square d is uh, this one okay into dk square right and if i ask you guys multiplication per kernel yeah so if you take one particular kernel how it's going to look like it is going to be dg square into dk square into total is n. So what we got here m cross n now we are having m basically. All right. So I can say this particular thing will get multiplied with one whole channel. This is what it means. Did we get this? We tried to eliminate one Larger value called m. Yeah. This is what is the aim of doing depth wise. Okay. Now let's try to do the second one, which is called point wise. So in point wise, okay. First of all, are we clear on this? Can I move on? Yeah. Okay. So right now, are we saying it's only one channel we are taking at the time? Correct. Only one channel. Which means that there will be three DKs. Exactly. Only three. Perfect. All right. Now comes the second one. So now when we build the second one, then you'll get the whole picture. You'll get why are we doing this. So let me rebuild our image. Now what will be my image? I said there are two steps for this. So if the output of step one is this. This will go as an input to my step two. So let me not redraw it. Let us say this is my input image. Okay. Now, what am I supposed to get out of this? I am supposed to get the same stuff out of it, which is dg. I will not rename it, otherwise you will get confused. What is dg and dk and all these things? Let us say this is our output we are expecting. dg cross dg cross n. So now I am expecting n number of output. Now I am not saying that one filter per channel. I am not saying that. Okay. Did we get it? Now what I'm doing is I'll redefine my filter. So here what we did, we made one channel. Now what I'll do is I will have a one cross one filter and it will go to how many channels? It will go to all M of my channels. This is how my filters will look like. This is M. Understood? One cross one filter only. But we have to make M number of filters. So when I do these two together, I'm going to get dg cross dg cross m. Sorry, n. Please be careful. There is no more n here. n. Okay. Now, if you ask me what is one multiplication look like here. So, let us do. So, this is called point wise. Point wise. Okay. Now, one multiplication. Can, can somebody tell me what does one multiplication look like here? See here one multiplication was dk square dk into dk dk square. Yeah. Here one multiplication will be? One cross one. One cross one. one but, cross. Yeah. So I forgot to write one here because we were targeting the whole channel. So I wrote one here. 
In this case, it will be 1 cross 1 cross m. Can I directly write m? Yes. Correct. Good. Next. What is the next parameter? Multiplication. Yeah. So what will it be? dg square. dg square into m. 1 cross m. Into m. m. Perfect. dg square m. Yeah. 1 cross m. Perfect. And now if I ask you what will be my final multiplication, you guys will say n into this number, dg square into n. Agreed? Yes. Simple. Now as I said, this is synchronous process. Syn sorry, this is a sequential process. Sequential means what? So if I want to find out my total computation, how should I do it now? I will say total is equal to depth wise plus point wise. What is my depth wise? This one. dg square into dk square into m plus m into n into dg square. Agreed? Now what are we going to do? We'll take out the commons. What is commons? Can I say m into dg square is common in both of them? I'll pull it out. M dg square. What am I left with? dk square plus n. Everybody is clear till now? Now we will see how we will compare this computation. So can I say this is the answer of my depth wise separable convolution and this is the answer of my total convolution. Right? Yeah, now if I want to compare these two, what should I do? Can I divide them? I'll take a percentage. This divide by this. See, it's like you want to say that okay, my uh, my current, uh, say for example, salary is X. Yeah. And uh, let us say you change your job and you got a salary X and your current salary was Y. So how do you do it? This by this will get a percentage of rice. Very simple. So in this case, what I will do is I'll just divide this by this. So we'll just see the computation here. So m dg square dk square plus n. So let's do that. Uh, we'll have m. One minute. So I will put numerator, I will put uh, depth wise. Denominator, I will put whole convolution. Okay. So whole convolution is nothing but dg square into dk square into m into n. Agreed? And on the top, it will be m into dg square whole multiplied by dk square plus n. Right? <clears throat> Let us check whether it's written correctly or you misplaced it. m into dg square dk square plus n. Perfect. Now we'll start canceling. So can we, can I cancel dg, dg? Yes. Can I cancel m, m? Yes. What am I left with? dk square plus n divided by dk square into n. If you separate the LCM, what am I going to get? Can I say I'll get 1 upon n plus uh, n upon, upon dk square. Upon dk square. Mm -hmm. All right. So now can I say the equation which was full of multiplication, now we have kind of put addition onto it. So I'm not saying we have transformed it, it is just a percentage, but yes, we have got some addition. Now you take an example. Now you take an example saying that the total number of output you get is say uh, 1024, for example. Yeah, you have this many number of uh, filter maps and say your input or your filter dimension say was usually we use 3 cross 3, right? So let's say put 3. Can somebody put the value here and tell me the answer? So I have 1 divided by 1024. Okay, so that is 0 0.009. Okay, plus I have 1 divided by 9. Okay, how much you got? 0 0.1. Anybody got this? So the answer that I got is 0 0.1. Now can somebody explain me what does this mean? The numerator is 10% of the denominator. Do people agree with that? 
or no? Yes. yes. So can I say I have reduced my computation by 90% by following these steps? Yes or no? Okay. Yeah, I want everybody to understand, no, just not for the sake of yes. I want everybody to get the depth of this because without that, mobile net will not be clear and in probably next three sessions, I am going to use mobile net. Yeah? So Amit, Dhruv, Harish, Kranti, Raghu, Saurav, Shakti and Vishnu. Akash, are we good? Everybody? Uh, Krishna, I, I have one question. Uh, yes. In mobile net, uh, no, you said depthwise and pointwise. Depthwise mm -hmm. and pointwise is, uh, you, you know, uh, is, a, is a part of mobile net. Yeah, this is how mobile net uh, uh, works. This is how we will design it. What okay. is this? These are nothing but convolution network only, right, Harish? So we yes. will just reframe it. That's it. The way we reframe unit, same way we reframe this also. Oh, okay, like so, so depthwise and pointwise is part of mobile net. I mean, yes. So if you package them together, if you package okay. both of this together, this becomes your mobile net. Okay. Uh, All right, Krishna. Like, uh, what's the advantage of uh, doing the doing the depthwise and pointwise like in more like difference like from an uh -huh. yeah. So the uh, the sort of the exam the uh, advantage here is one image that I was say processing in hundred steps in convolution in normal convolution now I am using only ten percent of this to process it so that this could be used on handheld devices. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. This is computationally powerful, but. Hardware wise, it is very challenging to put it on a handheld device. This is computationally not that powerful, but it can do almost the same job with 10% of your resource and power. Okay, okay. But uh, you know, we, we call one, it. one more thing. Yeah. Just one more thing. Uh, for point wise, so we are taking the output of checkwise convolution. Yes, correct. This one goes as an input to this. Okay, okay. Right? Okay. Good. Everybody is good with it? Alright, perfect. So, if you guys have got it, the concept of, see, this is one way of developing your network. So, tomorrow when you guys go into industry, say, five, six years of only computer vision experience, then even you will be, you know, uh, uh, it, it is possible from your side to build up your own network and then keep using it. It's all about the way you put the convolutions here and there. And also about matching the sizes. So if you follow these rules, definitely you can do mix match of anything and try to find the solution. All right. So now why did I do this in detail is because I did not find a very good uh, solution on this anyway. So that's the reason I went deep. Uh, this PPT is good, but I will not say it's ultimate. So yes, now if you look at these things, you will perfectly get it what I was talking about. Okay. Yeah. So this is what is the final slide. You have to look at it. This is what we did just now. Finally, we got almost similar answer. Now I can understand the PPT. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. See what happens is if I directly start showing you these things, no? these these are not very simple things to visualize, to be very frank. So that's the reason I went a little bit on scratch. And now when I deliver this PPT, it should be good for you guys. Okay, good. So we have depth wise, same concept, point wise, same concept. Uh, step one, step two, and then finally find the computation power. So here in this case for mobile net, the side is always one. So, how did you come to that conclusion? Yeah, because when I was looking at uh, the filter mm -hmm. that was, mm -hmm. it looked like uh, taking individual uh, filters separately. So, stride one actually. Yes, stride one takes care of everything. Yeah, very good. We want to have the same input and output, and stride one does that. Yes. Okay. Let me check this, Amit. Uh, good question. I have a so not thought about it. This stride is always one. I usually don't play around with stride. I keep it always one. Okay, let me see to this if, if it is statistically correct. But yes, it looks like stride should be one as you are saying. 
because we are taking everything. All right, good, nice observation. So this is how a mobile net possibly looks like. So if you want to convert, say, if you are inputting a uh, 224 cross 224 cross 3 image, this is how you have to go ahead with this. Yeah. So we'll come back to this detailed architecture when I will show you an implementation probably next week or next to next week in mobile. This is just to prep you guys that something is coming down the line. Be ready. Yeah. Good. Uh, yes. So now coming to something very interesting. So this is what we do in industry. Yeah. So from now, whatever you are going to do, you are going to implement it. If you are working on computer vision, yes, you will use these algorithms very often. Now. So now comes the real CV. What is faster RCNN now? Uh, if you guys are okay, shall I delete this or we are not referring this back, right? And question to all of you is, we just proved that we can make convolution networks fast. Agreed? I just proved it. We can do the same task and 100% and same task will be done in 10% of computation power. Now, what if I'm still not happy with mobile net? What if I'm still say, okay, fine, I still want to do faster part of it. Or else, let us put this way. Let us say there is an image like this, okay? And uh, say there is uh, a person in the image. Uh, eyes, nose, got some hair, okay? Uh, neck, shoulder, arms, okay, something like this. Imagine. My drawing is not that great. Yeah. Okay, some person like this, yeah. Now, my intention is to, if my device is supposed to focus on the face, so my convolution neural network algorithm should give me a beautiful box around the face. Yeah. Also, using some kind of generic stuff, I can say that, what if I draw a box like this? Don't you think the box is going to cover the face and the person anyway? Yes. I don't want to do that. I don't want my algorithm to go spread like this. I want my algorithm to be very precise. Where is the face of the person and just to tag only the face, not the generic one. Yeah. Why do we need it? There could be multiple applications where you need to check who's coming in, who's coming out or for facial detection or for any other thing. Yeah. So in this case, my convolution neural network will work good, definitely. But can somebody tell me how many, first of all, we can detect it's a face using our classification so far what we have done. How should I put a, uh, a bracket around it? You know, I have to put a line. Or else if to show you guys what I mean, I hope you would have seen this flying around on if you see this, this is a very simple uh, uh, stuff where you have got a lot of people and then they are tagging. Yeah. So how should I get this line? How should I get these lines? So classifier will find out that yes, there is one face. How should I find out or how should I draw that box? So one answer is segmentation. Good. Perfect. Okay, good. Segmentation is an answer. What else? Or I would say to be more precise on the spatial point and draw draw a spatial point and then use the distance matrix. We can find the one. Let us say we will focus on to nose or we'll focus on to eyebrows or mid, and then we can say that on an average for a human being, this is the distance on both the sides, and we'll imagine and we we'll put a imaginary line around it. So I will say, um, uh, how do you define that? I will say point and next point. So what I will do now is think this way. Yeah. Let us say I have this image. So what I will do is in a very simple way, I will, I will randomly, first of all, I will choose one filter size. Okay. Could be any size. Sorry, not filter, a box. 
and I will start running this box all over the image like this. Okay, randomly I will put this box over the image. Okay, now what I will do is when my filter uh, box goes and sits on an image, I know the dimension of the filter. So I know what part of image I'm talking about rightly. So from which cell to which cell I'm talking about. So I have an idea of the geography of that image. Now what I do is I take this as an output feature map of your convolution. And I input this to a fully connected neural network to detect. I will tell my fully connected, check if I, you, are you able to find a face in this? If it says one, that is yes, I will say that whatever I tagged, yes, this is a face. Simple. All of these will get FCN and output as zeros. These all will get FCN and output as one. Agreed? <coughs> Simple? Yeah, but there is one challenge here. If anybody is able to spot that challenge. How many of these to how many of these to uh, generate? We don't know, right? So the normal RC regional convolution neural network says we will randomly put two thousand of these windows in the image. Okay. It says an image can be scanned by putting these two thousand windows. So the challenge here is for us first of all to maintain these dimensions of two thousand windows locations, and second is to get it passed through FCNX. But yes, it works very well. So apart from the three solutions that we got, two solutions we got, you can do this one also. It is called regional convolution neural network. Okay, so I will just give you an idea because for week three content, we are not going deep into it, but it will make your videos a little e easier. So, uh, 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 yeah, just have a look at RCNN. So what we have done here is this is my input image. We are randomly putting approximately 2000 proposed regions. We are saying that these region could be, there could be an object in this region. Yeah. Now, it is not necessary that when you take a region, pass it through CNN and fully connected, you are going to say you are going to get an image uh, object out of it. Not necessary. Some of them will fail. But yes, the ones which have will pass through. The only good thing here is we will know the location where to put the box. That's it. <clears throat> Simple. This is called regional convolution neural networks. That's it. Okay. So I think you are now week four videos. This is what is the base of it. Okay, let let us talk quickly on fast RCN. And now mm -hmm. we found out the problem. Problem is time. Now I am still I am very eager to use this. How should I improvise on time? Can somebody think about it? How should I improvise here on time? What is time killing stuff over here? This 2000 is a time period. How should I improvise on this? So my solution, the fast RCNN is consists of somewhat of your answer also. So what we have done? We are parallel. Sorry, can you repeat that? 2000 regions, right? Mm -hmm. Should we treat each of these region as a separate convolution then? Mm -hmm. No, I will say no, not a separate convolution. We can give it in combination. Let us say if we say batch size is 10, I can take 10 feature maps together and put in FCNN. Yeah. If you take one one, no, it will take a lot of time. But yes, that is also a correct case. Some of our RNNs take it one by one. So you have to do 2000 computations. Okay. So let me show you one fast RCNN. So what we are doing now is, Proof instead of increasing the size of the total filters, no, I am saying we will increase the length of the filter. So I can say I will have one filter like this, another filter is given by the red, and third filter could be something like this, which covers the whole image. Now what I do is I have three zones. You people agree with that? I have knowledge of three zones. So what I will do, I will take one of the zones, I will put it through convolutions. First convolution, I will divide into two parts. One will be my soft maps, which will decide whether there is a face or not. 
another one so if there is a face yes another one will give me the dimension of this uh, line that i'm making got it so regressor is to find the x and y dimension softmax will be used to get the face so if both of them are if this is positive definitely pull it with together and say that draw a circle or draw a line or a square around this particular region because we have detected softmax output that is face so put a small comment here that face detected and this is the line of correct so the larger ones that you see here the larger uh, filters that you see here are nothing but roi region of interest <clears throat> Okay, so we will we'll do this in detail in next session. So you get to know how to do that. Now, still I am not happy. You first of all, one question to all of you. Now, do I say my speed is increased? I will say yes because I don't have to now do two thousand computations. I just have to take three different filter computations here in this case. Still, if I am not happy with it, if I want to increase the size of it, can I do something further in the same architecture here? Okay, let me give it away. What if I want to still improve something? So what I will do is rather than these two regressor and the classifier being in parallel like this, do you think this parallel? Yes. Instead of being parallel, what I will do is I will make them sequential like this. So I will say this is my image. This is my convolution layers. This is my feature maps. These are nothing but the squares that we have proposed. Go and put it into one variable called proposal and when you do this, classify it. And once you classify it, if there is a correct output, pull that out. So yes, there is not much difference between this and this. But the only thing is here, we are not having parallel process. We are having a synchronous process. The same proposals are going in for classification. So computationally, this will be little faster as compared to this one. And if you look at the standard timings that they have measured and published papers on to, CNN, we have no, depends on the application what we are using. RCNN takes 40 to 50 seconds for one image to be classified. RCNN, fast RCNN takes 2 seconds and faster RCNN takes somewhere near 0.2 seconds. Yep. So we'll see down the line. So I know some of you will be confused how, how this is possible. We'll see down the line. But at least go to the video that will make some clarity and post that. We will check on that how this works out. So if I if we now felt this was complex CNN, just imagine how complex this is going to be now. And the next week is also going to be a little. The coding now I feel is going to be out of bounds. Okay, good. So I think we are done. Let me know if you have any questions. Else we'll close down. This brings us to the end of this semantic segmentation tutorial. Now, before you guys sign off, I'd like to inform that we have launched a completely free platform called Great Learning Academy, where you have access to free courses such as AI, cloud and digital marketing. So guys, thank you very much for attending the session. Have a great learning ahead.